Welcome everybody, good evening. Thank you for joining us today for the Roundtable Women in Medicine. This is presented by the American University of Antigua College of Medicine. This series of live streamed Roundtable features our own esteemed alumni and they are dedicated to giving you, the audience, a chance to connect with the alumni and faculty and learn what they are going through. My name is Parth Prem Kumar, and I'm the advisor to the president for special projects at AUA. Today's discussion, Women in Medicine, provides us a unique opportunity to spotlight the dedication and perseverance of AUA-trained female physicians. We are so proud of you. They have completed medical school and gone on to improve lives in various locations. As you know, yesterday was International Women's Day, which is a global day celebrating the economic, political, and social achievements of the women past, present, and future. We are definitely talking to the future. In celebration of this day, AUA would like to acknowledge and highlight just a few of the many influential women in medicine who have become leaders in their space after graduating from AUA. We are very excited that they could be on this panel with us. But before we start, just a little housekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation for the alumni or for me or about AUA, please type them into the comments. I'll bring them up during the presentation as well as the Q&A session at the end. Now let's meet our wonderful alumni. First, I'd like to introduce 2013 graduate Monique Liu, who I've got to read her bio because there is so much, <laughs> who was valedictorian of her class. Dr. Liu is now in Premier Women's Health in Honolulu in Hawaii. Don't we all want to be there? <laughs> and she has been ranked as among the top 20 doctors for 2020 in Honolulu. Welcome, Dr. Lung. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so yes, I am Monique Leung. I was uh, born and raised in New Jersey, and uh, I went to college in Pennsylvania. Then I went on to complete my medical school education at um, AUA. and. Then I did my OBGYN residency back in New Jersey. Um, and then I moved to Hawaii. Uh, and it's been great. Uh, I'm in private practice in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I work with um, two other physicians. Uh, we also do infertility. We do um, a lot of ultrasounds. We also do um, aesthetics in terms of Mona Lisa to help with um, incontinence and vaginal rejuvenation. And then of course we do the OB obstetric side, which is the most fun part of bringing new life into the world every day. Um, and then aside from working, I, you know, for me, I enjoy dancing. So I also teach at a dance studio for fun, for workout, and of course love the sceneries of Hawaii and enjoying the water and the sun and, I know everyone's jealous in the mainland, but that's the positive side of being in Hawaii. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about me. That That's awesome. And you know what? You're right. You know, especially with the temperatures we've had on the East Coast, we are jealous of you. But <laughs> thank you for sharing that. That was, that was an aspect of you I did not know about the dance. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, and next, awesome. next, let's go to our 2016 graduate, Jessica Thomas, many faceted person, and now she's working as an emergency medicine clinical instructor, as well as covering ICU. <laughs> Share a little bit about yourself, Dr. Thomas. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Jessica Thomas. I am currently a clinical ultrasound fellow at LA County. Um, in Los Angeles. Um, it's a one-year fellowship program. So as I am working there, I'm also moonlighting and I'm working as an attending physician at several different hospitals in LA. Um, and I'm also moonlighting in New York right now um, for an ICU as an ER doctor, um, kind of like just doing critical care medicine in like the acute phase. So um, 
Yes, uh, I'm doing ultrasound. I did my uh, undergraduate in Rutgers. I'm from New Jersey. Um, and then I did my master's in Temple, uh, master's of public health. Then I ended up going to AUA where I became a physician, <laughs> which is like the dream come true. Um, and then finally, uh, I did my residency in Brooklyn, New York, and now I'm in LA. So the weather is much better there than it is here in New York for now, but uh, it is warming up. So that's a great thing. <laughs> That's nice. Well, it was not planned to have people from warmer parts of the country. It, it was not planned, I promise you. I think we got a little spoiled in Antigua, so it was... <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you did. Now, finally, we have um, 2019 med graduate, Nandanita Topadhyay, who is a resident physician at Mercy Health Family Medicine Residency Program. Uh, welcome, Nandini. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm the baby here. I am just taking my, my baby steps into residency. Um, I'm Nandini. I was born in Ohio, Cleveland, but I was raised in Calcutta in India. I wanted to do medical research initially, but my mom is an OBGYN physician and she does infertility. And I was fascinated by how um, amazing her connection with her patients were. So I was actually doing master's in integrated uh, biotechnology and bioinformatics um, in a collaborative program between St. Xavier's and Northwestern when a physician in uh, my PI, my private physician who I was working under, he was like, Nandini, I don't think you are meant to just work in the labs. You like talking to patients. You love talking to my patients. Why, why don't you consider like going into full-fledged medicine? And it was at that time, along with my inborn passion, probably like the combination of both, I decided that maybe, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. And my mom was like, of course, you should. But I, I would love for you to be a physician if you want to be. And then it was AUA. And um, I honestly love doing my rotations in New York City. And I thought that I'll never leave New York City. But my interviews were all over. And um, I, I loved the Mercy Health the Rockford program because it was offering me so many multifaceted uh, approach of family medicine. Like if I even want to do a hospitalist, if I want to do an OB fellowship, if I want to go into sports medicine fellowship, or even if I want to do further uh, primary care, I can do whatever I wanted. And they had all the facilities that helped me approach it. And I'm so thankful that I am now in my second year because intern year was rough <laughs> it was really, really rough and um so now as second years I'm just get so yesterday I completed my first 24 hour and today I had like half a day and then went into clinic and then there was an emergent procedure so they usually call the seniors and I was on call for it so I had to like run back and forth and now I am um currently tonight I'm off but I start night tomorrow so this has been my journey, even though I feel so jealous looking at you guys. I'm like, I hope I can reach that position someday. This feels like it never ends. But I'm so proud of all of your achievements and especially Par, who literally was one of the inspiration for me to go into AUA and Percy Medicine. So thank you all and happy Women's Day to all of you wonderful people out there. Well, thank you so much, Nandini. That's very sweet of you to say that. And yes, I do remember your coming for the interview. And I do remember talking to your parents endlessly about sending you to Antigua. Uh, you know, and I'm so glad that they did listen to me and did send you because I think AUA definitely benefited by having you there. So, and you know what? The next couple of years are just going to fly by and you're going to say, oh, what was I talking about? You know, it's all done. It's done. It's gone. So let's go on to your passion for medicine. Monique, tell us what, what really made you go into medicine? Oh, that's such a big question. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, I always was fascinated with medicine. I think it started when I was a freshman in high school. And um, this is going to reveal my age, but uh, <laughs> it was during SARS because I know we're going through COVID right now. So it was right. during SARS pandemic. And um, obviously in high school, you don't know much, but um, I was able to kind of touch base with a lot of the physicians that were kind of running SARS, you know, in Hong Kong at that time. And um, I helped to do a charity to just kind 
kind of uh, give money over there. And just being able to see kind of the impact that they have, that they had at that time and controlling mm. this disease. And I don't know, the power that they could, that they have over, you know, such a um, profound disease and um, being able to help so many people um, was just kind of the initial interest of what got me into medicine. Um, and then, you know, as I went, as I got into medical school and but even before med school and college, I uh, followed a few doctors. So I followed some an OBGYN, a pediatrician, and internal medicine, just to see like is the medical field really, you know, or or do I just want to be in a white coat and that's it. And so, um, but when I did the rotations, you know, having that, you know, I was fortunate enough that the physicians I followed they had such a great rapport with their patients, and you could really see in those patients' faces, you know, how much they, you know, depend on them um, with their health. You know, whether it's preventative medicine or current treatment and how thankful they are, you know, when they do feel better, whether it's from medical treatment or surgical treatment. Um, and that feeling that, you know, you get from those right. patients, I think, you know, it's just not, you can't replace it with anything. It's something kind yeah. of from within. Um, so that's kind of how I realized, you know, this is where I want to be. I don't know if I would make it through, but it was something that I wanted to give myself a chance to do. And Hopefully be, hopefully be able to be another great addition to the medical team and continue um, the amazing work that all of these other physicians, you know, have, have done over the many, many, many years. Sure, yeah. sure. No, I think, I think you're very, you know, you're on the right track and I think you're there, you know, you're, you're really, I mean, OBGYN, like you said, bringing new life, what could be better, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's, you know, you're there, fantastic. Jessica, what about you? How did you end up uh, in medicine? I mean, was it something you always loved and wanted to do or, you know? Yeah, I mean, I always had an interest in medicine ever since I was pretty much born. I think I started with the operation game and I really was like, oh, this is interesting. My mom said that when I was really young, I wouldn't watch Sesame Street, but instead I would um, watch some of those uh, surgeries that they would they would play on uh, like PBS and things like the live right. series. <laughs> we watch those all day, apparently. Um, I have very little recollection of that, but it's just something that was always like, oh, well, I'm going to be a doctor. Like, that's just who I am. <laughs> and then I think um, it turned into, it matured into a real love after um, oh. I volunteered um, in high school. I was like, well, I said I was going to be a doctor, but I really want to find out more about what this is about. So I ended up <laughs> volunteering in the emergency room, actually. <laughs> so, um, and I just remember just watching all the patients and, and watching the physicians interact with them and just like saving them. And um, I remember a lot of times I had family members that might be sick and we spent a lot of time in the hospital when I was young, just like supporting my family and just being there and just being in the hospital just felt comfortable to me. So I would, I would just feel, feel like, like this it. is what I'm supposed to do, you know? Um, and then I got accepted to AUA and I thought I was going to do one thing, <laughs> completely <laughs> believed that I was going to be a surgeon from the day I walked in. Uh, and then I did my surgery rotation, realized that was not what I was supposed to do. So I found my niche in EM, which I'm really, really happy about. And it was it was a perfect fit. So, oh, that's, that's really, you know, and this is something I hear so often from people. I went to medical school to become a surgeon. And then I realized I really don't want to do surgery anymore. And, you know, I want to do something else. I hear this so often. But that's, you know. This this is this is what makes you all so successful. You are doing something you're passionate about. You know, this is this, you've got to you've got to love what you do. You're not going to be good at it otherwise. You know. Tell me, uh, Nandini, do you did you have any fears? I know your mom is a phenomenal doctor and a role model for you. But did you have any fears yourself about will I be able to get through med school? Will I succeed? So um, I don't think it was a fear of getting through med school, but I felt so at place when I was going through the rotations because initially when we went, so I was so much like a research minded person. I was thinking that um, I hope that I can continue research after my um, medical school. And I was very much focused on the academic aspect of medicine. 
But when I went through each of my rotations, my confusion was like, I did not know which one I liked better other than the fact I loved OB. <laughs> I loved OB and I loved family medicine. I remember that these two rotations I enjoyed so much. And people often think that, oh, it's maybe because your mom went into ob gun. But I was like, I never saw her do any of this. Like for me, she was just a doctor to, a, to her patients and she was so specialized. I never like saw her delivering babies or anything. I used to just hear the stories. But even now, like today, I was, uh, my program director was telling me that you're so passionate about the OB aspect of family medicine. I love the, uh, like more the uh, OB, like the vaginal deliveries compared to C-section because I don't like <laughs> surgeries too much. <laughs> it's but, not late, you can switch. <laughs> I know. They I always think they're trying OB. to, no, they're trying to push me for an OB fellowship. And I was like, oh my God, I have already delivered like, 40 babies in my within my second year so they're like you can do as many as you want and if you meet the requirements maybe you'll just do a, like a OB fellowship or a women's health track but so for me it was more like I I hope I'm able to um, get through the different parts like the different hurdles of medical school and finally find my passion find my feet and find what I am meant to do and I felt that when I was, like I said, in my OB rotation and family medicine, the reason I love family is because I'm able to not only take care of my OB patient, I've been able to deliver her baby. I'm her baby's PCP. I'm the PCP of the whole family. They trust me with their life. And now they're like, I hope you won't leave us after you have your residency. And I don't know how to this connection with patients and day-to-day uh, -day understanding and finding out who I am, who I am meant to be, uh, patients advocate or patients, um, maybe somebody who can influence them just by sitting and talking to them for a little bit and making right. a little difference. So um, I think, yes, even though I have seen my mom like be an amazing physician, it was still a journey for me because finding out exactly what I wanted. Did I want to go into PhD or want I would I have just done all this all over again going into medical school, medicine, but all my uh, co like my friends, my uh, uh, other people are so much further advanced. I'm still doing medicine and they're like, when are you finishing studying? Are you ever going to be done? Like maybe not. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. What <laughs> it's, it's that is that really is, I think, a trait of a good doctor. And I've been told this by GPs in, in India that they don't stop studying. They're always reading up on new techniques, new medicines, new stuff. And, you know, and because I've, I've always wondered, I go to a primary care office and he's got all these books and he's got all these magazines and, you know, all the medical stuff. And I'm like, but you know all this. He says, no, I don't. I don't know all this. You know, I need to keep reading. And, you know, I think that's part of it. That's, you know, again, it shows your passion. You yeah, want to be yeah. the best. You want to yeah. be the best for your patients. Exactly. You know, yeah. it just it just shows your passion. So, uh, you know, the journey to get the, the MD degree, we all know it's it's hard. It's tough. It's a lot of perseverance. Do you have any, I'm going to open this up to all three of you. Um, do you have any tips or practices that you feel uh, really helped you while you were studying, while you were doing your step one, your step two? What What do you think worked for you all? Nandini, go first. <laughs> yeah, I'm more fresh. <laughs> so um, I think the reminder every day that there is a silver lining at the end of it all like every day your hard work whatever you put into it is going to be the result so if you are determined to reach the end of it and see the reason why you are putting so much effort every day so i kept looking at the bigger picture i kept reminding myself this is not where i'm supposed to end this is not where my life is going to be stuck this is not a shelf or an exam is not going to be taking away what i want to do in life so oh. i have to get through this i have to make the most out of it if i don't have a good base i won't be able to go into rotations with enough knowledge and if i don't have my clinical skills i won't be able to go into a residency without knowing what i'm doing so to i think the most important thing is focus on the bigger goals 
I tell students all the time who reach out to me, even now, that uh, what if I do badly in one exam? That should not be the determinant of your next step. Like one exam should not be the reason for you to decide if you should pursue medicine or not pursue medicine. Move through it, move past it. Remember that if you have done well, very good, move on. If you've not done well, then that should be a reminder that maybe you can do better. So the changes are the, I think like the way that you look into it, the way that you approach, you have to be a positive person. It's right. hard to get to each and every day, but look at the bigger picture, focus what you're gonna be even a few years from now. So think about it and you should not be stuck where you are. You'll get through it. Sound words, sound words. Jessica, what worked for you? I think I'm um, just realizing that not everything works for everyone um, and realizing that your classmates or your colleagues might not be um, exactly where you are. You might not understand things the same way. You might not learn the same way. And just realizing that you need to find your own way to learn and retain the information, be able to um, apply it appropriately is really important because your self-esteem can be hit when you see other yeah. people doing better or if you see other people not doing as well as you are, you start to, you know, maybe get a little bit more um, proud or <laughs> a little bit too puffed up. Um, like, it's just, a, it's really... It's, it's a journey. It really is. And just being aware that this is a lifetime of learning and that this is going to be, there are going to be ups and downs and, and um, being cognizant of that throughout is really important. It keeps you sane. It keeps you stress-free and it helps you to learn because then you're not as, as like uh, an Indian was saying, not as brought down when something, if you, if you fail something or if you don't do as well, you'll just have to pick it up and do better the next time. So. Monique. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, these are all great. I mean, for me, I know it's been a long time, but <laughs> uh, I think the first thing for me, I think being positive is really the most important. Um, no matter how many times you fall, you got to pick yourself up and keep on going and knowing that at the end of the day, what is your primary goal? What made you want to become a doctor? And that should be the one that drives you through whatever challenges that come your way. Um, I think for me, Personally, you know, having group studies um, really helped me a lot mm. because you get to work just like what Jessica say, was saying is that you get to work with uh, all these different minds. People we're all studying for the same test or same board exam, but we all study differently. And it's actually amazing yeah. to really see how people's strategy of studying and how different that can be. And for me, I always try to relate every test you take, even though it might seem like, oh, it's so technical. I'm never going to use this in medicine. I, this is not even clinically related. I always say the day you step into medical school and whatever test you take, think of it as that person's your patient your patient is having this problem and how are you gonna get through it? And I think for me, when I thought of it as oh, every question I look at, it's a patient with a problem, not that it's a test question, then I think it motivates you in a different way of how to study, how to answer that question. You know, you don't wanna get it wrong because if you get it wrong, it's not about failing the test, but you could be hurting a patient. And I think if we all think of it in that sense, I think our mind, you know, really takes us to different places and we don't get, hopefully don't get as nervous. Oh my God, it's a test, it's a test, but rather, hey, this is like a patient that you're gonna see and um, and these are the problems that they're facing and now how are you gonna go and, and you know, help and fix it. And I think that's why for me, working in a group setting has always been a strength for me that got me through medical school and got me through residency because, you know, we motivate each other and and we're all going through kind of similar challenges, but maybe different types of challenges. So my strength could be my colleague's weakness and her strength or his strength could be my weakness. And that's how, you know, we help each other. And so for me, I think that was really a big thing that helped me go get through medical school and residency, knowing that I'm not alone and that all of us really, the friends that you make, we all have a common goal of why, you know, we want to be a physician. Right. And right. no matter what tests you go through, what boards, there'll be plenty of boards that you have to take and all these certifications. And it can be super, super daunting. But having, you know, those solid group of people that you can work together with and, right. and, and study with really, really, really helps a lot to, you know, strengthen that confidence and get you through it. 
<laughs> that's awesome. I mean, you know, that, that's a totally different take, Monique, and that's that's awesome. You know, and it, obviously it works because, you know, you are where you are today. So it, obviously it worked, you know. So let me put the three of you on a spot. So I want to know from each one of you what was a very rewarding and a very challenging um, event or time that you faced while you were at AUA. Jessica, you want to go first? Uh, while at AUA, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I um, let's think. So, I actually had a really hard time with passing the comp exam when I was at AUA. It was something that was a big challenge to me because it, I felt like it was the test that was bigger than anything. This is the qualifying exam for step one. Um, and I remember it just being bigger. I just kept making it bigger and bigger in my head. Like to me, it was right. the biggest thing. Um, and I was like, I have to do well on this. I have to do the well. There's no alternative. Like I can't mess up. Um, and I think I put so much into that test that I didn't, I lost myself in it. Um, and it was a huge challenge trying to use what I knew that I knew. I did well on all my shelf exams. It's just this composite exam that I just, it just, it kept escaping me. I couldn't figure out why I wasn't doing well in it. And then I just had to take a step back and remind myself of what I was doing um, and try to just focus. Like, I think the way Monique mentioned it before, I, uh, just looking at each question as a patient. I think being in the emergency yeah. room, especially for my emergency rotations, um, I would think about my tests while I was there. And I would start thinking like, oh, I remember a question like this. And then trying to apply that knowledge and just use it in real time and really like delve into the material to get a better understanding of it in a more clinical sense helped me to really do well on that test ultimately. Um, but it was it was a big challenge and it was just all in my mind because there was no reason for me to do poorly on that test. I had done well on all my shelf exams. Um, it just felt like it was, it was everything. Um, and then I did well on it and then I did well on my step exam and then it, it was over and then the next step, the next step came literally <laughs> and then the next test came and I just getting used to um, taking tests like this on a daily sure. daily basis was really a big sure. challenge for me and um, AUA definitely was very very supportive for me um, my friends family were very supportive and helped me get through that rough time so I have a lot more confidence now in taking exams and I'm almost numb to it it's not like a big deal anymore because i have so many that's great all the time um and, and i do well because i'm able to think clearly and i'm able to do what i need to do to get through so Super. nandini wow so rewarding and challenging hmm i think uh one of the biggest challenges for me was I was actually really, some of the times when I hear uh, these parents call me and say that, oh my goodness, so how are you, how did you adapt to the island life and all of that going from where you are and everything and um, the fact that what would you expect there, how is it? And I don't think like adjusting to the island life at all was any difficulty for me. I'm very social. I love talking to people. Um, but I just, I think like if I would have gone back, I would have told myself that, remember not everyone comes from the similar mindset as you are. And um, I felt that in certain ways, certain times, I go above and beyond to help people. And there were instances when um, there were a few people who I felt like had exploited the help that I had given in terms of like giving them, like uh, helping them study and everything. And I was just not used to having being surrounded by people who had both positive <laughs> and negative uh, intentions. But, you know, I, I felt like that helped me grow as a person. I went there as such a naive, innocent, like now I think about it and I'm like, <laughs> wow, like you have grown up a lot. And another thing I think was always um, at the time when I was there, AUA was trying to better each and every semester the way that the curriculum is set up in order to make it more at par with like American medical schools. So I was there at the time when the uh, different changes were being initiated. So what I went through in my first semester was completely different from the uh, the whole uh, way the exams were being taken in the second semester. So by the time we got used to like one uh, setup, it was changed sure. to the second setup. So now that I think about it, I feel like 
maybe that is the reason that when people complain about changes in residency, I'm like, uh, we have been through bigger yeah, changes yeah. and we have survived it. <laughs> so I don't think this is anything. And when I, um, and from the look of it, like, you know, the rewarding times were maybe I, I didn't even know how I brought about something positive in the life of one of my um who, uh, like my group partners like when we used to do these group sessions and she told me that the reason that she was able to get through her mini exams which was the exams in the island that we had to take like each and every block and even though I was done with mine and she was still like she was in one semester below me I spent hours and hours just to make sure that she's able to understand the content more than like, not just like rote learning or memorizing, just understanding what it is. Why are we doing something like just look beyond that. And she was able to do so well. She, she did actually, she was one of the toppers from her class. And she said, she even like went up to the podium later when she had to give a speech and she mentioned my name in like the, the, Flex room when there were so many people and she said I want to point out to that girl and I thought oh my god did I really do something like that was I think the most amazing rewarding experience that I was able to help somebody and who who even recognized it even though I was feeling like am I doing too much like should I like tell myself like okay just take care of yourself first before taking care of others but I think that's what AUA taught me like don't just just give just try to help yourself as well as the other people as much as you can because sure. you never know how it comes back to you and there is karma at the end of the day so oh, totally totally that works yeah that was my experience <laughs> monique you were with us at the beginning when we all started <laughs> so tell me what were some yeah. of the challenges <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i was there um when we had the old campus right and my last semester there was when we went to the new campus which is gorgeous um very very different um you know i always like to start with the positives so i would say my most rewarding experience was being a teaching assistant and um i was the head teaching assistant for multiple subjects over there and to me i mean teaching has been a big passion of mine um because I know sometimes it can be very challenging with the professors and their lectures because they're so smart that they, you know, the way they lecture, it can be in such an advanced level. And to me, like being able to break it down so that the students understand and then them scoring well or the whole class having a great um, test average and then them coming to me saying, oh my God, like this really helped me. I passed my test or whatnot. So for me being at AUA, that really um, was really rewarding for me. Um, to be able to kind of share that knowledge and, and help other AUA students um, succeed and, and get through um, the classes. But the challenging part I would say is, I think I really give a lot of credit to AUA is that, you know, a lot of medical schools and even undergrad, you know, I went to a private school, um, there, you know, you learn a lot about the academics and the medical part of it, but they don't really teach you about life and reality of life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think AUA was kind of a big eye opening for me about, you know, how to handle, you know, life in general and that nothing is like spoon fed. Like, you know, things are not always right. spoon fed or like handed to you, like if you're in a private school. But um, so for me, you know, with rotations, because I was in that transition in the beginning, I think now AUA has definitely grown a lot. But back then, um, you know, doing your rotations, it was really important for you to really be on top of it. And they, I think AOA taught me a lot that, you know, um, not everyone, you know, is, um, not everybody works the same way. And that, yeah. you know, you have to take, you know, you are ultimately responsible for yourself. So even something so simple as an email not going through or a fax paper not going through, you know, these things you don't think about in med school because all you're thinking about is studying, 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 getting through it, getting your MD, but all this other stuff really is important in actual practicing medicine and having a business or working in a company. And so I really thank AUA a lot, you know, for those challenges because um, it really, kind of gave me a lesson of, okay, yeah, like I need to be on top of it too, not oh. just 100% trust, you know, everybody else, but that I also have to take equal 
equal part in making sure like, okay, yeah, like this is the rotation that comes next, you know, making sure that, and sometimes it could be a computer glitch, which that's what happened to me. I had a little computer glitch and I was, my name wasn't on there for one rotation. Um, and then all of a sudden, because they taught me to really just follow up and make sure that then it was okay. And, you know, everything was fine, but that's kind of, for me, was a challenging thing in the beginning stages of AUA, but at the same time, I'm so thankful for it because now in real reality <laughs> of all the places I've been to, um, they've definitely prepared me to deal with those exact challenges uh, now. No, absolutely. And as you said, you know, you were, you were there with us when we were evolving, we were growing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those challenges were a whole different kettle of fish, you know, they were, they were, it, was difficult. <laughs> yeah. it was difficult, you know, and then you come through all that and then you realize, okay, now I can face most things that are thrown at right. me, you know, right. but this right. is why these webinars are so important because we want, we want prospective students to know from you all who are actually the feet on the ground and you're mm -hmm. telling them that, you know what, this is it, you know. You know, you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to face it this way. They need to hear that from you. And Monique, I know you dance, so I know you balance your stress uh, <laughs> with that, uh, you know. But, uh, but what about you, Nandini? What do you do? I mean, you, you know, how do you manage your stress levels? Yeah, yeah. So um, in between like uh, last year, July to right now, I have initiated this weight loss program for our clinic as well as for our residents wellness kind of wow. health okay. and everything together in which um, I love dancing too, just like Monique said. And I used to love acting and theater. So back home in um, Calcutta, I used to do one act plays. So sometimes on Friday, especially if I have time and I, I'm not working um, on a call on uh, next Saturday, I usually try to do one hour to two hour sessions when we do high intensity interval training we do some sort of like our dance oh workshop uh we try to do we incorporate community outreach services so for valentine's day we all got together and did um we did paper flower bouquets for uh residents in the nursing home that we visit to take care of patients so that it will be something nice for them and in a weird way it's just so relaxing for even yeah. us to do something outside of of medicine because nowadays I feel like we eat sleep drink everything is medicine like everything is True. so um that part that time usually it's like two Fridays in a month when we do that but otherwise on a daily basis every day I put half an hour to 40 minutes aside just for myself when I do either meditation yoga or some sort of training um, some sort of looking out like otherwise it's difficult to survive especially through COVID and through residency combined together, it was just hard. It was really hard. So um, I think that being positive is important and being surrounded by people around you who are positive and like-minded is important too. Um, spend some time in with, the, with families or talking to somebody not in medicine just to get another aspect about life other than this part. It's been always uh, stress relief for right. me. I can't be with my pet dog, but I, whenever I go for a walk and I see other dogs, I, I'm always like, can I just cuddle? This is my wellness. <laughs> so yeah, that's, um, that's how usually okay. I balance. Yeah. And Jessica, you're in, you're in ICU and emergency medicine. How do you cope? I mean, how do you manage the stress? Uh, yeah, it's, I just love it. I honestly, <laughs> It's really strange to say, but like I, I will be in a code and I'll, you know, had a really crazy day yesterday. I had two patients that were very, very, very sick in the ICU. They were coding back and forth and I was running back and forth and I'm teaching residents and I'm trying to manage everything. Um, and it's just like I went I went home and well, back to the hotel and I was exhausted. I was like, oh, my God, that day was so awesome. Like I. I just love it. I just really love it. Okay. Um, and another thing is I have my husband who's an ER doctor who also went to AUA and I always have him to vent to, which is very important. <laughs> Something that understands everything I'm saying. I don't have to break down like all of the different like more tubes or Ooh. anything else that I'm going to go through. Um, he understands and he's he's like, oh my goodness, that would be crazy if I saw this. And I'll show him my images and it's, it's great to have someone to bounce that off of. So, Okay. 
Fair enough. I mean, yeah, it takes, I mean, everybody has got different, you know, different ways of just, just screaming and venting and, you know, <laughs> uh, de-stressing, so to speak. Tell me, Jessica, when, when you work with the UA, how did you manage your time, you know, because I know, I mean, I, I like I told you, you know, I, I talked to even the current students and I know they're all juggling and struggling with time management. Did you have a formula that worked? Um, more like a schedule. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm very, very type A, so I, I write, I actually have a planner that I put all of my things in. I write down what I'm going to do, what I need to do for at least for the day. If I can't get that done for the day, then I make sure it gets done for the week. Um, so I would do that with studying. I would do that with like making sure that I exercise every day or at least three to five times a week so that I'm, I'm you know, moving and, and staying active so that anything that I read, anything that I understand will actually stick. Um, so all those things come together. Um, I think that if you are able to manage your time uh, that's like the biggest, one of the biggest lessons you learn in in medicine, essentially, is managing your time because it's something you'll have to do for the rest of your career. Um, and if you don't get good at it, you will not be as successful as you want to be, honestly, in any field of medicine, uh, because it's it's impossible to be able, you're doing so much, you're, you're being pulled in so many different directions in order to have the effect that you want you need to be able to manage your time. So um, scheduling is really important for me, writing down things, making sure that I'm um, prioritizing what I need to do, giving myself, I time myself a lot. Like with my phone, I'll put my alarm, say I can only do this for an hour, I can only do this for 20 minutes or whatever. Um, so that, you know, there's- That works, that day. works. Yeah. <laughs> so given that it's International Women's Day and, you know, uh, I know, uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, discrimination and there's, a, there's, a, there's stuff flying around all the time. Uh, tell me, tell me um, any tips you have for somebody who's trying to follow your footsteps. They're, they're all listening to you. They're all looking at you and saying, oh, my God, you know, so we can be successful. We can do well. Uh, what, what would you what would you tell the incoming students? What would what, what do they need to do to start out and finish? I know we always say start with the end in mind, but what would your advice be, Monique? Um, I think the first thing is to make sure you're in the field for the right reasons. Um, I think that's a really important thing. We get influenced by a lot of people around us, um, whether it's through media or family or pressure from people around us, but make sure you're in the field for the right reason and that um, you know, you're there for the patients and for yourself, because just like Par said, you have to love what you do. And this can be a very um, vigorating um, uh, field. And you will not, you know, for me, no matter how vigorating it is or how um, how hard it is even now as an attending, you know, all the struggles to me, I don't see as a struggle because I love what I do and I want to be better at it every single day, no matter how, how hard it gets. Um, so that's the number one thing of going into medicine is making sure you know exactly why you're going into medicine. I would say the second thing is to have compassion and, and honesty. Those are the two qualities that I you know, have seen in so many physicians. And that's like, to me, what really makes them great. Um, I mean, technical academia is important, of course, but, you know, no one can teach compassion, no one can teach honesty, no one can teach work ethics. And if you have all those values, no matter how hard it gets, you will get through it. Because, you know, knowledge, technique, surgical technique, all of that can be taught but you can't teach, you know, those main things. And the last thing I have is, you know, getting through med school or deciding to go to med school, making sure that you know that it's a continued learning process. The learning, the studying will never stop. So if you think, oh, I'm gonna get through med school and I'm good, I'm good, I'm gonna go and do my thing. That's not true, unfortunately, not that <laughs> medicine is changing all the time. I mean, we have COVID pandemic now to really show us that, you know, that's the great thing and the downside of medicine is that 
it's not for, you know, the knowledge is not forever. You have to keep learning, new things will develop, everything's gonna, you know, and you have to keep up to date with everything, medicine, surgery, all this stuff. And you have all these innovative and creative physicians that wanna make things better and want us to do things more efficiently and proficiently. Yeah. So you're constantly studying every day and it has to be something that you enjoy to do, not something that you're forced to do just to pass a test but it's something that you want to do sure. because you want to sure. be the best of the best and you don't want to just do what everybody else is doing because that's just how it's been done for 20 years. You want to know right. that you can make it right. even better. So Absolutely. to me, those are the top three things that I would say to keep in mind, you know, when applying to medical school. Yes, I think, I think that you've covered it all, Monique. I mean, you're absolutely right. If, you're not, if you don't have focus, if you don't have a passion, this is going to be a very hard road for you. Mm -hmm. you, know, you it's, it's going to be impossible for you to succeed. You right. really need to keep at it. Tell me, um, you know, as a female physician, um, all three of you are in different fields. Uh, what has been a very gender specific challenge you all faced um, or a barrier you faced because of your gender? And how did you work around it? I mean, other than you know, try saying I'll just thump you on your head and just carry on my own way. How did you get around it, Nandini? My experience is so funny. I I bet like some of you might able to um, even associate yourselves with it. So suppose we have an admission, right? When we go to the ER to get the admission for our teams or anything. And um, usually if it's on a night and I'm wearing a jacket and I'm wearing my scrubs and I'm not wearing my white coat, I'm just wearing my jacket and my, um, my set and everything. I walk into the room of a patient who is talking on the phone and the patient goes like, so honey, I need to go because the nurse is here. I need to talk to the nurse. And I'm like... <laughs> Oh, just because the the doc, like the ER doctor was a male physician and I walk in and I am a woman, you think that I'm a nurse? Well, I always say that it's amazing that you think I'm a nurse because nurses take care of patients a lot and they do everything. So I'm happy that I'm able to give you that amount of care. But I'm a doctor and I'm Dr. C. I'm here to take care of you and everything. But it's just funny, but so like in it's, it's a stereotype it's just, it's just yeah. Yeah. and that's the um that's the funny part but then i i tell them the next morning you remember me right from yesterday night yeah i admit i, did, I admitted you i'm dr c and they're like oh yeah 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 sure dr c we remember you <laughs> but um it's it's really i think the another thing that is um there is suppose in a in the ICU setting. I know Jessica has been through all of this, but in an ICU setting, when there's a male resident and I'm a female resident, and we are both there to do a procedure or something, and if the nurses are there and they will automatically think that the male uh, resident is going to be the one who can do it, and I'm like, I, I have done more procedures than him, and probably I can. I'm not saying that I'm better at it, but I can show you that I, you know, like. The way that they will respond to him is different than the way that they respond to me uh, sometimes, or it's probably it's because of like women and women or something. There is something that I have seen, but they have grown. I have grown. I know that this is probably going to be there. And uh, in the long run, it might be in different ways that people experience it. But as long as I'm able to show that I know what I'm doing and I will take care of you and probably you will come back to me later when you need something. And that's exactly what happened okay. to that nurse. When she needed Aww. something at the saw and she was like, Dr. C, can you please write this order for me? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I just work, but um, those are the two instances which I remember very okay. well. Yeah. Jessica, I see you nodding and smiling. Tell uh, me. So yeah, I can relate a thousand percent. I think probably every female physician has an experience like that. Mine are almost multiple times a day. Um, I get that I am too young to be a doctor <laughs> and I'm probably a PA or an NP or an health aide, home health aide. That was a good one. Um, EMT, tech, anything, anything. And, and you know, and I, I think that it's something that I used to really get upset about. I'm like, I worked so hard. I'm here. You know, it says doctor on my jacket. Like, please give me this, you know, a little bit of respect. And, and you know what, I, in the long run, it doesn't matter as much to me anymore 
Um, I definitely used to get really upset about it, though. But now it happens yeah. like, so often. There's no way that I could continue to be that upset about it. Um, I just try to teach people. I guess women can be doctors too. Yes, I can look young and I can still be a physician. Yes, that's right. I've been doing this for a very long time and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to do what I have to do to get you where you need to be. And and just letting them know that, you know, I got this. I think it's yeah. really important. Yeah. It's really yeah. important. And, and when it comes to like nurses and other um, healthcare professionals, again, same thing every day. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a daily thing. Um, unfortunately, it's the society that we live in. It's the historic, histor historical facts of what medicine has become or where, where it came from. Um, and it probably will take a long time to change that. Um, but I think we're getting there. We're getting, it's getting better every day, um, for sure. Um, it's just funny to me sometimes. And, I, and, it, and I'm proud, you know, because I like to... I like to show them that I can I can do this too. Sure, and be able sure. to be, you know, that female that looks young and whatever. <laughs> you know, I'm the one that they the least expect um, to save their family or to give them the news that they wanted to hear. You know, so. And I think I think you both of you. I mean, Nandini, I haven't heard Monique yet, but Jessica and Nandini, you handled it with poise. You handled it with class by you know because you went to medical school for a very long time to get the way you are you know and then and then for someone to think you're too young to be a doctor i mean you're like look mate i mean you know i went through one of the toughest exams i could have done you know <laughs> so yeah definitely monique what about you because you're in hawaii and you don't know how it works there yeah, I mean, I completely, uh, I'm in the same shoes as uh, Nandini and Jessica. Um, I've been called a medical student. I've been called a pharmaceutical rep. You know, even now, I'm kind of starting to take it as a compliment now because I'm getting older. So that means that I <laughs> I'm keeping my youth in my face. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think in OBGYN itself, it's nice because obviously we have a lot of females now in OBGYN and that society is kind of changing in terms of that gender discrimination, but we do still have a little bit of that in terms of surgery. So I do see that where I come in and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be the surgeon. And then they kind of look at you twice, like, how, how many have you done, right? I always get that question. How many C-sections have you done? How many deliveries have you done? How many hysterectomies have you done, right? Um, and it's like, like Jessica said, you know, it's part of our world and it is something that, you know, we, we know that is there and it's just something that has been built up for so many years and now we're just trying to change the face of it. But the positive thing that I see that's going on in the world is that, you know, at the end of the day, you, you are really responsible for your own image. And yeah, you might initially, they see me as this young woman. Oh, really, she has the surgical skills to do this. But after the fact, just like Nandini said, if you're proving your skills, the patients do well, they recover, they are so loyal. And at the end of the day, you're teaching them a lesson sure. that it's not just about the look, but as long as you have the knowledge, you have the skill, at the end of the day, you know, all patients are open-minded to realize that, oh, wow, like, you're, yeah, someone else can do it. That's not a male, you know, that's not older, right? They always consider the older right. you are, the, you know, being a man, you're the best surgeon. And then you come in and you just do what you have, you know, you do what you're taught to do and you do it well. And then when they wake up, they're like, oh, my God. Wow, yeah. And then, and like Jessica said, that is like, you know, it's such a great feeling to be able to give that to our patients and for them to see that, yeah, you know, all of us might look young, but we are, you know, we are capable and we do have the knowledge and skills to, to do what we do. Yes, and I, I think it's difficult, but like you said, it is changing. The world is changing. Mm -hmm. Monique, what do you think would have been a piece of advice you wish you had been given before you joined the medical school? Oh. You know, given advice. everything you've spoken about, you know, the academics, the, the tough part of medical school, and also, you know, the the gender, gender specific challenges. What do you think would be the one thing that you wish, I think somebody had told me this. Oh, that's a, um, <laughs> I'm going to think about it. I think I have um, an answer to that. If oh, yeah. Let's, let's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's Jessica. Um, yeah. yeah, I feel like when I started, I never thought that there would ever be anyone that would possibly try to discourage me from anything. 
Uh, I never thought that that would happen. I really didn't. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm in med school now. I'm good. I just have to make it through and everything will be fine. But there's going to be discouragement along the way. And I sure. think that just keeping your eye on the prize and just realizing, like, this is my dream. This is my passion. This is what I was meant to do. Anything that anyone has to say, it can't bother you. It can't. There's no way that it could even have any effect on you because you've already made yourself known. You know why you're there. You know what you're going for. You know what you're doing. Um, there's always going to be some form of discouragement in anything that you do. And I think that especially in med school where you're, you're doing something brand new, you're doing something that nine times out of 10, you've done nothing like this before. And you're, draw, you're trying to create this life and career for yourself. So you're already out on a limb. Um, and people will try to knock you right off that limb. And they do. They try. Um, oh. But they can't. There's no way that they can if you have that in you. You have that passion. and You really work towards it. Um, I never expected to have any discouragement. I really thought everyone was going to have my back and really, like, support me. Um, oh. But you might have to support yourself sometimes. And, you know, that's just the way it is. And, and oh, as true. a woman, as a physician, you know, we can do that. Yeah. We, we were made for this. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think you triggered my memory. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah. I think the one thing I wish I knew, you know, before med school is that, you know, I, I think, you know, through college and high school, I, I always, always thought, you know, as long as you work hard, like you're good. As long as you do it, you're going to, you're going to get through it. You're going to do well, no problem. But I think if someone told me that sometimes it's not just about working hard, you know, you got to work smart as well. Um, whether it's through, you know, schooling, through networking, whatnot. Um, I think if, you know, that was something that I, I learned, I wish somebody told me before I started that, you know, you got to work hard and work smart. It's not just working hard, hard, hard. Doesn't mean that, you know, it's, you're going to get anywhere if you're doing it the wrong way for four years, right? Um, but to me, you know, I didn't know that. I just figured, oh, as long as I'm disciplined and I just keep studying for however many hours, I'll pass the test or I'll do this. It's not true. And so, yeah, I would say that would be an advice I would want someone to tell me before I started. Nandini. I think like uh, Jessica and Monique said so many wonderful things, especially when Jessica said that discouragement. I have like there has been so many times that we have seen even in residency how how people can actually try their best to pull you down and that is and your success can be somebody's insecurity and unfortunately at this stage in life i really didn't know that uh, this would still be a very important thing to look out for to watch out for and when i uh, called my mom with tears in my eyes saying, you have taught me how to be a strong girl. You never taught me how to deal with this. This is pettiness. Then my mom would be like, this is something that unfortunately anybody, anybody in no, yeah. no matter what field they are, especially in, she told me, especially in medicine, unfortunately, people will sometimes try their best to pull you down to make you look bad because they know that you are a threat because they know that you're doing good, because they know that you will succeed. And uh, those are the times that remind yourself whose daughter you are. And if your mom has been able to go through a time in her life when male-dominated society was what uh, doctors were, and I, I, was, uh, I was quiet, but I would never let them dominate me then you being my daughter can straighten your crown, go ahead with a smile in your face and show them that just because I'm a soft hearted person doesn't mean you can break me or pull me down. I am good or probably better. And um, yeah, this is what I, <laughs> I, I will tell anybody going into medical school, especially girls and women that like Jessica and Monique said, work hard and work smart and also don't let discouragement get to the point when you will doubt yourself. Uh, don't let insecurities or your self-doubt bring you down, ever. And there will Every. be days which won't be as good. There will be days. Oh, when absolutely. Not. I mean, everyone's <laughs> got a good day when you don't, you know, everyone's got those. But you're yeah. absolutely right. You know, you shouldn't let anybody pull you down. You, you know, you yeah. should say, no, it's fine. You know, I'm going yeah. to go ahead. No, absolutely. Now, let me let me get a little bit serious before, you know, we're having a lovely chat and you know, I'm going to get told off. Did, uh, when you were at AUA, do you think you had enough um, support 
uh, when you were going through the academics and when you were in clinicals? Do you think uh, we had enough support to make you succeed? Any one of you, whoever wants to start? Absolutely, the uh, EED, the uh, tutoring and the um, like the TA situation that was happening when I was there. I'm sure. not sure if it's still the same. Um, the education enhancement department. Department, yeah. I was a TA there and as well as a tutor and being a teacher in that setting was really helpful for me. Um, I was, I participated, I was a student in a lot of those classes and I, I learned as much as I could. And I think that that was such an ultimate support for me, particularly trying to understand how I learned and how to retain the things that I was um, being exposed to. So it's one of the best aspects of AUA that we had at that time for sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think they really prepared us in that sense. And I think what I really enjoyed about it, too, is that you gave us the opportunity to rotate in a lot of different. Um, I'm not sure if that's how it is now, but when right. I did it, I had the option to rotate in various states and, you know, being able to move to state to state and at the same time, you know, how to you know rent an apartment and how to like deal with that stuff in terms of real life. And then um, being able to have the opportunity to work with different people from different states and learning that, I think that really was really helpful too. And yeah, I give a big kudos to the Education Enhancement Department as well. The TAs um, were really like a big part of, of my learning as well. Yeah. And my support began like from the time that I spoke to you, Park, over the phone till the time I went to the island. And I cannot thank how amazing even the faculties were. And the fact that they would even ask you sometimes to just, I remember some of them would actually take interest in figuring out, is everything going okay? Is everything fine? Um, just even beyond academics, like, are you doing okay? When are you going home? Or um, how is family? Something very different. Or you're go walking across the hallway and you meet them and you're just talking to them about life in general. And I remember even when I was in my um, clinical rotations and I would talk to my advisor, especially, oh my goodness, she was amazing woman she would make sure that i have my preference for doing a rotation in a certain place worked out and i know that she's probably handling so many other people i would just make sure that i put it a little ahead of time just to make sure that i'm able to give them my um from my end the reasoning and then she would work with me she would uh, call me if something would not work out she would try her best to accommodate me and so going from the faculties to the EED, like they all talked about, Monique and uh, Jessica, and uh, the staff behind, um, Bar you, Mamta, then uh, people who have been in the island faculties, um, Dr. Uh, Balachandran, Dr. Pai, they were amazing. And, uh, and then my advisor, who has been able to get everything in place for my rotations to uh, uh, like go ahead smoothly without any glitch at all. And the people I met while I was in my rotation, some some of the faculties that who are a part of our system, the good letters that they have written on my behalf, which even were talked about in my interviews. So I have received very good amount of support and I tell it to everybody that don't feel that this is it. Is Am I gonna be that insignificant person sitting in the corner of the room? Nobody even knows about me. What am I doing here? Am I even gonna go anywhere from here? What is this? There are so many students. It's not like that. You will be cared for, you're valued. And your success is a UA success. So think about that every day. That's how I look into it. That's, that's really heartwarming to hear, in fact, from all three of you because for us who are the admin and for us who sit in New York, very far away from Antigua, uh, we sometimes wonder, oh my God, I hope they're all right. I hope they're doing okay. And I, I know many of you have got calls from me just to say, you guys okay, what's going on? You know, I haven't heard from you for a while or I haven't seen you on Facebook for a while. What's going on, you know, <laughs> you okay? Uh, it's just, it, it's concerning, but I'm really happy that we're doing something, you know, right. And as Mr. Simon always says, you know, we're there to help. We're, we're family, the AUA family. And many of you know that, you know, yes, you're all my family. Many of you know that. So, yes, uh, it's really good to hear that. Now, I, I know Monique's running low on her battery. So I just want to ask one, one thing. Monique, 
what would be your one piece of advice to women going into medicine? What is the one thing um, they should ask themselves before they get into med school? Um, just, you know, I, like I said, I think from before, you know, um, that medicine, you know, that you, why are you, why are you going into medicine is really for right. me, the most important question is why are you going in? Is it for your family? Is it for yourself? Is it right. for an experience that you had um, from before that had such a huge impact on your life? Um, to me, I think that's really the most important question um, before going to medical school is why are you going to medical school? And, and then, and then just doing your research and always understanding that you may have a plan of what you want to be. I was like, Jessica, I never thought I was going to do OB. Um, I actually hated surgery. <laughs> and, um, and then you go through the process and you learn about things and you thought you knew it, you knew a lot. But once you go through the process, you learn even more and then you start realizing your path starts changing and just being acceptable to know that your path might change depending what your experiences are. So it may not be what you plan from day one, may not be where you are at the end of it but to keeping your mind open. Nandini. I would say dream big and don't let any thoughts ever. And um, don't think that you're taking up space when you are stepping forward to ask a question during rounds. Don't feel that you're not, don't feel that you fit into that space. And remember, if you put in your hard work, you show with compassion and care, with a smile on your face that you're here, do it right, and to do it and to work as hard as you can and um, be the best doctor, be the best version of yourself, then you are in the right track. And don't let little bit of discouragement or little bit of um, heartbreaks here and there make your day or make your bigger um, passion and dream be shattered at any cost. Just move ahead. And Jessica. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, mean, I want to echo some of the same things that uh, Monique and Nadini said. I think you belong. Just remember that you're there for a reason. You belong there. You earned your spot there just as much I as just... anyone else. And don't let anyone take that away from you. Um, and make it what you want it to be. Like it's your career. It's your opportunity to make yourself who and what you want to be. And you can't let other people dictate that for you. So as long as you have asked yourself, I'm, why am I doing this? What am I doing this for? What's my ultimate goal? Um, then you realize you know, where, where you are is there's a reason for it. And, and you belong there. And it's, it's your spot. It's, you it's, deserve it. Absolutely. So as we are reaching the end of this round table i have a couple of questions coming in from the viewers um and you know i just want to first of all let me thank all three of you for taking time out on you know your night off and you know all this and monique in the middle of her work they uh you know to answer questions and because there are people watching who are possibly thinking yes i want to be a doctor but i'm a woman can i can i do it you know and seeing you guys is really really motivating for them so one of the questions which has come through is, how did AUA help you become the physician you are? Uh, any one of you, whoever wants to go first? I think in um, answering that question, definitely we've touched on it several times throughout tonight. Um, but definitely AUA helped me to grow as a person to realize what was important to me, uh, my priorities, um, even just like, figuring out my time management on a daily basis um, has helped me to write, really prioritize what's important to me in my life. Um, and AUA definitely came came right on time to like remind me of what, what I'm doing this for. I've always had so much support from AUA. Um, even when I wasn't positive myself, even if I wasn't positive enough, I, there was always someone in my corner kind of rooting me on. Um, and I think that with that, type of encouragement that kind of support um you can pretty much do anything you can pretty much do anything um and it's just a matter of finding what it is that's most important to you what where your passion in medicine really is um and aua really helps me guide myself through that situation um and i was able to find the dream job that i always wanted so okay yeah. and, and without, yeah without aua i would not have been where i am today 
So AUA was the bridge between my passion, between about what I want to be in life and who I am today. So uh, right from the time of laying the foundation of uh, getting my aspirations to come true, then also helping me uh, with the journey in which you find out about life, just like we all discussed about just not it's not about just studying and getting through. It's about life in general, meeting people of different backgrounds, different diversity, different uh, different living situations, figuring out certain small things like uh, rentals in different parts of the city, different parts of the state, moving from one place to another, meeting different people, uh, how to carry yourself through situations which might not be that easy. Um, how do you maintain your composure through situations which are highly stressful then there are exams and getting through them and realizing that these are not the end all be all they will be there through the rest of your life you have to get through each of them with a calm mm -hmm. head and then finally meeting um people in residency knowing from where they are i just feel so privileged that aua had provided me with so much of love support and care because without them like i said it would not have been possible to be where i am today and carry the name of AUA forward. Yeah, so many people have asked me, which school have I gone to in the Caribbean? And they actually have sent their children. Like I know of people who have my doctors and physicians that I've come across. So I think that's a success. That's uh, that somewhere down the line, people think that it's, they build good physicians for the future. Yes, you're absolutely right. And Monique, can you still with us? Yeah, I'm trying. I'm about 7%. Um, okay. Yeah, I think AUA has definitely, I mean, AUA is the reason why I'm a physician um, or else I probably wouldn't have gone uh, to medical school and have chosen a, a slightly different um, field. So AUA was definitely the, the chance I got to be able to go through med school and see where I ended up. <laughs> that's That's awesome. So as we are winding up, is there any anything that you would like to convey to the, you know, the, I'm, there are quite a few actually prospective students and families watching you. Is there any one bit of advice you would like to convey to them? Monique, you want to go first before your computer? Completely before I die out. Sure, yeah. Um, I would say at the end of it, you know, um, be proud of who you are. Don't let anyone talk you down. Um, it doesn't matter where you're from or, you know, what school you're from. At the end of the day, you are in charge of your own fate. Um, and as long as you are confident with yourself, you persevere, you're, you know, you work hard, you work smart, you just be yourself. Um, you will make it. Uh, it might be a little hard depending, you know, on everything that goes on in this world and all the discrimination and everything that we hear about with it, a lot of different things. But I truly yeah. believe that if you have the substance and you show that, I think people will listen and they will accept you and you will have that same opportunity. You just may have to fight a little harder for it. But if you just show your true self and you keep going at it and staying positive, you'll get to wherever you want to get to. Jessica? Yeah, I echo that 100%. I feel like uh, you have to really uh, just work hard, know what you want, go for it, and don't let anyone tell you that you can't. Um, you know, as a female in a male-dominated field, in medicine in general, but in emergency medicine specifically, I, I deal with these types of things every day. Um, and you have to have thick skin for sure. You definitely do. You can't go home and cry every day about things, but definitely, you know, your training and your your um, knowledge base really hold you and it's your foundation for whatever it is that you go through. Um, so no matter what, you know, comes your way, you always have that. You always have your knowledge base. You always have your, your medicine. You know what you're doing, so you can always stand on that. And Dini. I would say that I am not going to sugarcoat. There is no shortcut to success. It will be a lot of hard work, a lot and a lot of hard work, and uh, it will all be worth it. It will be worth it. You put in that hard work, you put in that dedication, you put in that commitment, you question yourself at the end of the day, why am I doing this? Trust me, you will know the answer. You are doing this for a reason. You are doing this to be somebody who you can you can help so many people with the proper education, with the proper training, with good intentions in your heart. And uh, dream big, dream big, and don't let anything 
anything be the reason that can hold you back from achieving what you want to do. And um, AUA will always be there to help you in whatever way you can. But if you don't do your part, then it won't be possible. Yeah. So um, do your bit, do your part and um, work hard. And it will be at the end of the day, it will be worth it. I swear, I mean, you all are so inspirational. And, you know, I know as AUA alumni, I'm proud of each and every one of you. But listening to you at each webinar, listening to listening to the panelists, uh, you know, one really does me good. Does me good. It really does. But thank you so much. And uh, let's wind up now before they throw us off the Facebook completely. But, uh, you know, really, once again, thank you for taking the time out of your day, off your night off, uh, you know. And Jessica, I know you've come off from a, you know, difficult shift. Thank you so much. And for your words of advice, I'm sure our students are going to appreciate all that they've heard tonight. Please be sure to follow us on AUA social channels to see which topic we're tackling next. And please repost whatever you can find about AUA. Let's get the word out there that success is definitely available if you are willing to work hard for it. Thank you so much. Good night.